Good evening, I'm Wendy Mesley, and this is The National. The Prime Minister admits NAFTA's future is unclear. We have to be ready for anything. CBC News learns what was said in private. The government scrambles to distance itself from another divisive tax plan. This guidance document created the wrong impression. Saying goodbye to Sears. I know I grew up with it. My father used to work there one time. Plus, drastic measures to cool the planet would take us to an unknown frontier. Which could be disastrous for us. The Trudeau government's trade offensive with the White House has been about killing with kindness. But CBC News has learned tonight that approach to dealing with Donald Trump on NAFTA may be failing. While sitting beside the Prime Minister today in the Oval Office, Trump once again mused that modernizing NAFTA may not be possible and that the deal may have to be ditched. But it's what he said behind closed doors to Justin Trudeau that suggests that outcome is more likely than ever. Katie Simpson has the details from Washington. The Prime Minister arrived at the White House in search of reassurance from his closest ally. But Justin Trudeau's personal bond with Donald Trump wasn't enough to influence the U.S. president to share Canada's vision on trade. Mr. President, is NAFTA dead? We'll see what happens. We have a tough negotiation, and uh, it's something that you will know uh, in the not-too-distant future. CBC News has learned that during their private meeting, Trump asked Trudeau if he would consider a bilateral trade deal between Canada and the U.S., if NAFTA was scrapped. While the ask is dramatic, Trump has publicly mused about this before, suggesting he prefers one-on-one -on -one agreements. It's possible we won't be able to reach a deal with one or the other. But in the meantime, we'll make a deal with one. But I think we have a chance to do something uh, very creative that's good for Canada, Mexico, and the United States. We're very much focused on uh, continuing to negotiate in good faith on modernizing and upgrading NAFTA. Trudeau didn't discuss Trump's pitch publicly, but a senior government source says he told the president continuing with a trilateral agreement that includes Mexico is Canada's preference. At an afternoon news conference, Trudeau acknowledged NAFTA talks have been difficult and that Ottawa is prepared for anything, including the possibility of the U.S. killing the trilateral trade agreement. The, uh, American administration and the president um, makes decisions that surprise people from time to time. Uh, and uh, that is certainly something that we are very much aware of and very uh, braced for. That view is shared by former Prime Minister Stephen Harper, who was also in Washington today on a private trip to meet with business leaders. I tell business the following, is it, um, is it conceivable or is it just not, not conceivable that, try, that the administration could cancel NAFTA? I believe it is conceivable. Trudeau also went to Capitol Hill today to remind influential lawmakers that no matter what happens with NAFTA, millions of American jobs depend on trade with Canada. Overall picture is one we can't lose sight of, uh, that we have benefited immeasurably from uh, what we have been able to build together. The committee Trudeau met with today is incredibly powerful. Trump would need its approval before he could formally terminate NAFTA. So, Wendy, that's why Trudeau spent his time today trying to influence those powerful lawmakers. And another trade issue, Katie. Uh, Trudeau also raised the huge tariffs that uh, the U.S. is slapping on Bombardier. Brought that up with Trump. Where, where did that go? Well, Justin Trudeau told Donald Trump that Canada is frustrated with the American decision to slap nearly 300 percent duties on Bombardier's made uh, Canada's C-series planes. Uh, now, of course, that came after Boeing complained about the government subsidies uh, that Bo Bombardier has received. Today, Justin Trudeau ratcheted up the rhetoric a little bit further, uh, taping, taking the uh, retaliation threats again one step further. Have a listen. The, um attempts by Boeing to put uh, tens of thousands of aerospace workers uh, out of work uh, across Canada is not something we, uh, uh, we look on positively. And I certainly mentioned that uh, this was uh, a, 
uh, a block uh, to us purchasing uh, any, making any military procurements from, uh, from Boeing. So it is clear that uh, Canada's plan to possibly purchase fighter jets from Boeing, uh, which had been in the works, it clearly is in jeopardy given this ongoing spat. Wendy. A big day. Thanks so much, Katie. Katie Simpson. And the head of Delta Airlines was also talking about those tariffs today and made it clear his company will not be paying. Ed Bastian told reporters on a conference call that the two recent U.S. rulings that slapped on tariffs were preliminary. He said, in our opinion, it is very difficult for Boeing or any U.S. manufacturer to claim harm with a product we purchased that they don't offer. He said, it's unrealistic, a bit nonsensical. Boeing successfully argued to the U.S. Commerce Department that Bombardier sold 75 jets to Delta at below market price. Bombardier is appealing both rulings. National Affairs Editor Chris Hall has been watching all the developments on this story today. So, Chris, are, are the talks going off the rails? Well, Canada's view is no, as we heard in Katie's piece. Uh, Canada prefers a continent-wide trade deal, not a bilateral deal with the United States, in large part because they know, first of all, that more concessions would be demanded in that one-on-one -on -one relationship. And secondly, there's no plan B for the Americans. Getting out of a trade deal uh, is complicated. But that being said, there are some worrisome trends here. First, Newt Gingrich, a former Republican uh, congressman and advisor to Trump, said Trump's people clearly prefer a bilateral deal because they can use their economic muscle. And from Mexico, uh, saying the, a couple of cabinet ministers saying this week that NAFTA is not as important today as it was when it was negotiated in 1994. So even Justin Trudeau in his uh, ending news conference with a reporter said, look, uh, they know that Donald Trump is unpredictable and they're braced for it. So some of the big demands haven't even been put on the table yet, maybe, maybe this weekend. Um, what should yeah. Canadians be ready for there? Well, you know, Trump approaches negotiations not as though it's a set of rules, which is how Canada's doing, but as outcomes is what he's looking for. And the two biggest things haven't been put forward yet. The first, of course, is a 50% content rule for the United States in auto uh, parts and in autos. Uh, and the other is, of course, uh, this idea about dispute resolution hasn't been put forward either. Well, these are very contentious things, not even to mention the, the, the five-year mandatory review. So uh, clearly these are issues that Canada won't agree to. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce called calls them poison pills. So for Donald Trump, if it's outcomes that you're really looking for, one possible outcome is terminating this deal. Another might be suggesting, as he did today, that he's prepared to negotiate a bilateral deal with Canada, even if Canada is not keen. So much to watch for. Lots to come. Thanks so much, Chris. Thanks, Wendy. Chris Hall in Ottawa tonight. So it was a small move that got a big reaction from Canadian retailers and their employees. A directive posted online by the revenue agency suggesting employers would have to start tracking and taxing employees' discount purchases. After a day of confusion today, the government said it has no plan right now to tax employee discounts. And it blamed bureaucrats for the bungle. David Cochran explains. Larry Rosen doesn't just work at Harry Rosen, he wears Harry Rosen. Employees at this store get pricey suits at a good discount and they're worried it will become a tax problem. I must have got about 50 emails. Jaws were dropped, people were stunned because it's such a cornerstone of retail. It's a problem for a government that says it wants to tax millionaires but seem to be targeting people who work in malls, which led to some major damage control. We will not do anything that disproportionately hurts low and middle income Canadians who, who we, need, we need to help. I mean, a lot of the low and middle income Canadians are struggling. After days of trying to explain the guidelines, the government has now yanked them from its website, insisting they are not targeting retail workers, saying they were not approved by the minister and that they were deeply disappointed that bureaucrats posted something that has been so misinterpreted. The prime minister even tweeted about it, saying, let me be blunt, we are not going to tax anyone's employee discounts. How can you say that we are cheating? This is not fair. It couldn't come at a worse time for a government that's already being hammered by small business and doctors over another series of tax reforms. And yanking these tax guidelines may only be a reprieve. The government says it will revise them and bring them back, but insisting it will only go after substantial employee discounts. But while it's going after workers, it's ignoring big perks closer to home. 
Every single member of parliament is entitled to free flights, not just for them, but for their designated traveler, a spouse, or a partner. Dozens of free flights per year, paid for by the taxpayer, tax-free to the MP. It seems hypocritical for one, it's tin-eared for another. Again, you've got a public that's already suspicious that politicians are always looking out for themselves. So to go after the little guy, but leave your own entitlements untouched, I think is just really toned up. It's also a controversy that threatens to undermine the Liberals' branding as a champion of the middle class. The government says it's committed to a tax system that is fair to ordinary Canadians, but for months now it's been their tax proposals that have made those ordinary Canadians extraordinarily angry. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. The employee discount could soon be irrelevant for 12,000 retail workers who may be just days away from losing their jobs, likely without severance. Sears Canada sent a memo to staff today about its plan to close all 130 remaining stores. And as Tom Murphy tells us, there are hard feelings. On the outside, not much appears to have changed, but inside, as roughly 12,000 staff nationwide pour over this new company memo, there are many questions about their pay, their pensions, and from at least one manager, anger. In an email, they write, many of us feel frustrated, anger, betrayal. Company was very much mismanaged over the last several years, if not longer. Many people went home already as they were physically upset. On the street, some sympathy. Like I feel bad as closing, but I feel bad for the workers that have been there for so long. Even a feeling like they've lost an old family friend. I know I grew up with it. My, you know, it's, it's, my father used to work there one time. He used to be a shipment receiver. But, but yeah. then there's this. I haven't shopped there in years. So no? It's not a big deal to me. But I'm sad. I used to like their catalog. And that sentiment says this analyst has been the death knell for Sears. Sears uh, found themselves, you know, rapidly falling into a sort of a lower quality, outdated brand. So, and that's where people, a lot of people have them. And uh, trying to pull it out of that would, you know, I don't think there's any miracle actually that can pull that off. So now what? Experts say malls will struggle to find a replacement anchor tenant as the bricks and mortar retail sector tries to absorb this latest hit. The Bay, take notice. You know, Hudson Bay is trying their best right now. They're still not quite where they need to be, but they're trying some things, as you know, internationally. They're also trying some things. With, they've really stepped it up in terms of their product line. That may help to start turn the image, but, uh, but department stores, you know, outside of, you know, outside of probably Walmart, uh, are really struggling. They, you know, people have gone more online. People have gone more boutique. A changing retail landscape that never quite seemed to be a good fit for Sears. If the company gets court approval, liquidation sales could begin in just over a week. Tom Murphy, CBC News, Halifax. Coming up, Spain demands clarity from would-be separatists. Plus, should a Washington Hall of Honor remove statues of racists? It is important for the younger generation to learn about the good, the bad and the evil. Indigenous women in Saskatoon are seeking millions of dollars in damages for what they say was coerced sterilization. Two women say their tubes were tied immediately after giving birth without proper or informed consent. They're suing the province, hospitals and physicians for, quote, institutional systemic racism. A Calgary man and woman have been charged with the murder of Hanek Afawark. The 26-year-old's remains were found on the side of a road in July after three bodies were found in a burned-out car that he owned. Police say the accused are also suspects in those deaths. With one year from a provincial election, Quebec's premier shuffled his cabinet today. Of note, Philippe Cuillard appointed Kathleen Weil as minister responsible for relations with English-speaking Quebecers. That fulfills an election promise made by the Liberals in 2014. When an eight-year-old boy mysteriously collapsed and died at school during recess, a community was shocked. A family was devastated. Months later, Griffin Martin's parents are sharing their story. And as Ashley Burke tells us, they're now pushing for change at every school in Canada. A wild imagination, for sure. His meticulous drawings, the unique way he saw the world, and the routines he loved... They're all part of the memories the Martins cherish of their little boy, Griffin. Before we go to bed, we had this routine where we just blow him a kiss and do the hug and we'd say goodnight. Griffin was the family's youngest child, 
an active eight-year-old with no known health issues. But this past February, Griffin was playing during recess when his heart suddenly stopped beating. School staff quickly started CPR until paramedics took over, racing Griffin to hospital. He never regained a heartbeat. And the best way I can describe it is an amputation of the soul. It's, um, I am, I'm not the same person. I never will be the same person. So the only thing that could have helped him in that situation is uh, an AED, uh, a defibrillator on site. Child patient selected. It's still not known if the device would have saved Griffin, but paramedics believe defibrillators should be in all public places, including schools. With patients in sudden cardiac arrest at any age, for any minute that goes by, their chances of survival decrease by 10%. Manitoba is the only province that has legislation making it mandatory to have defibrillators in all schools. In Ontario, there's no law, but there is provincial funding. We know that, uh, that school boards are, are able to, um, to provide AEDs uh, for schools, and, and many of them do. Griffin School Board has installed defibrillators in all secondary schools, but stopped short of every elementary school over training and upkeep. Part of it is, once you've installed it, making sure that it remains properly charged, that it's tested every month. Um, the only thing worse than not having one is having one that people think they can rely on and having it not work. The Martins have now launched a fundraising campaign to donate defibrillators to all schools in Canada, starting in Ottawa. I want to see AEDs be as common as fire extinguishers. I think they need to be everywhere where people congregate. They've handed over the first device to their son's school in his memory. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. The scandal engulfing Harvey Weinstein continues to intensify. The Hollywood producer is facing allegations of sexual harassment and rape from numerous women. Today, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, which runs the Oscars, said it will discuss Weinstein at a special meeting on Saturday. It's not clear what actions it could take against him. Weinstein won an Oscar in 1999 for producing the best picture, Shakespeare in Love. The British equivalent of the Academy, BAFTA, suspended his membership today. Fires in Northern California have now killed at least 21 people, with hundreds more reportedly missing. The dangerous winds whipping up the flames are expected to pick up again, threatening to drag embers and ignite hotspots. Kim Brunhuber reports. On the ground, against the fire, individual battles are lost and won. But when you see it from the sky, the war seems almost unwinnable. We're working very diligently. These are very extreme conditions. How do you put out more than a dozen blazes burning 400 square kilometers? Picture it, 100,000 football fields of fire. Entire neighborhoods have been incinerated. Our house is gone, guys! Oh my God, our house is gone! The landscape has been transformed. It's uh, completely unrecognizable. It's like Mars. No one knows how all these fires started, but they're acutely aware of what's keeping them alive. The wind, strong, hot and dry, blowing this way and that. Emergency responders spent all night and all day just getting people out of harm's way. It's all about life-saving and evacuations. Uh, my advice to those of you who are advised is go. So they pack what they can. If there's no time to rescue animals, says Mike Marshall, you can at least give them a chance. It looks like we're just going to have to cut fences and let them run wherever they can. Firefighters are now starting their own fires, hoping to starve the onrushing flames of fuel before more lives are lost. This is a serious, critical, catastrophic event. Hundreds are still unaccounted for. With so many cell towers down, it's hard to know who made it out. Thousands of Californians are now sifting through rubble, like Regina Jackson. I mean, at our age, it's hard to think about starting over, but, uh, you know, we're pretty resi resilient, and we will. <laughs> I mean, the first thing you think is, what are we going to do and everything that you're going to lose? Uh, Canadian Fred McNichol had to flee his house in wine country, but went back to the neighborhood to get help for a housebound senior. We went back to the hospital. The police didn't want to do nothing, so we have people help in any way they can. Unlike some neighbors, he still has a home for now. But the fire is far from being contained, so we're still not out of the, the danger. At any moment, he says, the winds could change. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Los Angeles. Straight ahead with no ultimatum from Catalan separatists, Spain has now come up with its own.
charisma. Supporters of Brian Mulroney say he's got it. Charisma seems to run in the family. This is 17-month-old daughter Caroline. Her 22-year-old mother is strategically expecting a second child in mid-February, right about convention time. Her husband is away campaigning much of the time, but loneliness is not a problem. I'm studying architecture. I uh, take, uh, I'm a part-time student because I, I have my, uh, my little monster here, Caroline, who uh, keeps me very, very busy. And um, I also do the, the housework and the jobs. We have, I don't have any help in the house. I have my, uh, as I call them, my terrific mothers around me, which help me very, very much. And uh, she loves them, so it's a, it's a big help. Well, it may be premature to talk uh, this way, but the end of the road your husband has taken is 24 Sussex Drive. <laughs> Have you ever thought about that? I really can't think that far ahead. I think uh, what will be will be, so we'll, we'll take one step at a time. At 36 and having never run for elective office, Mulrooney is a dark horse. His assets include natural platform ability. He first scored as a public speaker at age nine. Ontario Ombudsman Arthur Maloney says that next to Diefenbaker, Mulrooney is the best stand-up speaker in the party. Well, you are so good on television that, that your opponents will soon be saying, he's just a glamour boy, he's, he has no substance, and uh, he's just too good on television. What is your answer to that? Well, uh, I, you know, any opponents that I have can, uh, I, it's a free country, they can say whatever they want. And uh, we all have uh, our qualities and we all have our failings. And it's up to the delegates at the convention to make the determination as to uh, whom would be the best person to lead them through the next uh, difficult uh, years and to lead them to victory. The UN didn't mince words today on Myanmar. A new report describes attacks against Rohingya Muslims as well-organized, coordinated, and systematic. The Myanmar security forces purposely destroyed the property of the Rohingya population, scorched their dwellings and entire villages in northern Rakhine state, not only to drive the population out in droves, but also to prevent the fleeing Rohingya victims from returning to their homes. Hundreds of thousands of Rohingya have fled for Bangladesh, which is now struggling with a refugee crisis. The Prime Minister of Spain had a question today for the head of the Catalan government. Did he declare independence or not? It wasn't only about clearing up the confusion. The answer is critical for Spain to map out its next move. Margaret Evans has the latest. Peering through the haze in Madrid, people, politicians and newspapers all trying to decipher the meaning of the Catalan president's suspended declaration. Independence in installments, reads one headline. Farce and blackmail, says another. But if Carles Puigdemont's move yesterday was tit, this is tat. The Spanish Prime Minister Mariano Rajoy addressing the national parliament, accusing Puigdemont of creating deliberate confusion. The cabinet will ask the Catalan government to confirm whether it's declared independence or not, he said. Spaniards in Madrid seemed both puzzled and angry. If the Catalans don't have a clue what it means, how am I supposed to know, says this woman. In Catalonia, the non-declaration seems to have simply hardened existing lines between separatist and unionist camps. They are very homogeneous internally, but externally they don't talk each other. The crisis has put enormous strain on Catalonia's social fabric. These Barcelona firefighters stood between people trying to vote in the controversial independence referendum earlier this month and the police forces sent in by Spain to stop them. We take the flag of the dialogue and... Bernat Prachinestos belongs to a group called Firefighters for Independence. He doesn't see it as a conflict, he says, because it defends democracy. Once you tell me that I cannot vote about that because the uh, Spanish constitution uh, forbids this, it's, it's kind of telling, no, you can only decide about this with a war or with a king's marriage or something like that. It's, it, it has no sense. 
One thing the opposing sides do share is a fear that Spain will still go ahead with its threat to take over the administration of the autonomous region. Spain has given Catalonia's leadership until next week to answer the question on independence, whether they did, didn't, or still intend to. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Up next, can climate change be mitigated by drastic scientific measures? This conversation is too important, um, potentially too dangerous, to leave to just the scientific community. Paul McDonald looks at the risks of unleashing forces we can't really control. Plus, a forgotten Newfoundland hero of legendary proportions. Let's check the day's business numbers. The TSX edged up 30 points. The dollar increased slightly. In New York, the Dow gained 42 points, and the price of oil rose by 38 cents a barrel. We just gave the blah, blah, lift. This is Roger Tetro. He's a Montreal bill collector. That's his job. He also holds news conferences. That's his hobby. Here's Tetro three years ago, posing as the president of a fictional group called Water Aid for America, urging that Canada ship its water to the drought-stricken U.S. The national media gobbled it up. Here is the CBC News. A group of Montreal residents wants to pressure the Canadian government into diverting water from the Great Lakes into the Mississippi River. The French language network of the CBC believed Tetro was also a nuclear expert. Here he is telling a national audience how the Chernobyl disaster could rain down assorted horrors on North Americans. The now defunct Montreal Daily News had him under another name, Tubal Cain, and yet another vocation. It's been going on for years. In 1971, the Montreal Star thought it had a scoop an internal CIA memo outlining covert operations in Quebec. It even made The National on CBC. Under a CIA letterhead, the document reads, Subject, Quebec. It was Tetro's work, of course. Around the same time, he suckered the Toronto Star Weekly with a phony FLQ terrorist camp in the Laurentian Hills. I told myself, if they want fiction, I'll give them fiction. So I gave them fiction. Tetro says there are many others like him. Only nowadays, they're known as media consultants and spin doctors. Whoever's uh, got an axe to grind, they give their spin to it, and they get into the media, and uh, that's the story that goes out. He's absolutely right. Uh, governments, uh, anybody who's covered governments or followed things they do, uh, know that they uh, engage in this, where you want to call them trial balloons or disinformation, uh, they do it frequently. Is Tetro's career as a hoaxer over? perhaps, but he says he'll certainly keep trying, guided by the firm belief that there's a reporter born every minute. He mouthed two words, the first word of which uh, started with F and the second word of which started with O. Well, it, it's a lie because I didn't say anything. Did you, well, sir, did did you, you mouth it? it? What does mouth mean? You move, move your lips? Move your lips. Yes, I move my lips. In the words you've been quoted as saying? No. Did you intend well, to what, what, what did you what move were you your thinking? Lips? when you moved your lips. What is the nature of your thoughts, gentlemen, when you say fuddle-duddle or something like that? God, you... Well, the big topic on Parliament Hill today wasn't the Constitution, it wasn't the economy, it was the Prime Minister and his language. I heard him say very clearly, f***ing bastard. I convey to the Speaker uh, my regrets for any inconvenience, and I convey to any honourable member of the House uh, my regrets to them. Just... Quieten down, baby. <laughs> Liberal Sheila Copps didn't think the remark was very funny. I'm not his baby, and I'm nobody's baby, and I'd like him to withdraw those remarks. The House is no stranger to heated exchanges, but few have been this heated or this strange. Heat or shame. Now, I hear the word racist from that side. Do you have the fortitude or the gonads to stand up and come across here and say that to me, you son of a bitch? Come on! Daryl. Daryl. Harder. Harder. Stinson came within three meters of liberal John Cannis before returning to his seat. It was too much for one liberal MP. Shh. 
I did not say fuddle duddle. That was another generation. I, I, I think that we've reached a point where this type of uh, conduct, it's not only disgraceful, but it's unacceptable. It's almost like when you have someone who's uh, got a terminal illness and they're in the final phases and say, well, would you like to try this experimental drug? Sure. But what have you got to lose? Yeah, yeah. Planet Earth isn't quite terminal, but climate scientists are clear. When it comes to rising global temperatures, we are near or maybe past the point of no return. Could there be a scientific fix that seeks to cool the Earth while we struggle to curb our industrial habits? Our science correspondent, Bob McDonald, looked into what's possible, a risky long shot that could easily backfire. We can change the behaviors that are causing the problem. I think that this government has got the environmental conscience of Attila the Hun. I will not accept a plan that will harm our economy and hurt American workers. We are in a battle for a future for our children and grandchildren. Decades of debate while oil continues to burn. No more Johnson! Environmental movements, lawsuits, conferences, agreements, as we continue to damage our atmosphere. Scientists warning us there will be consequences if we don't act quickly and drastically. I became involved in, in climate and environmental policy in the late 80s first, and I am very frustrated by how slow it's been to get real action on cutting emissions. The reality is the glaciers are melting faster than the political momentum is building on climate change. That's just the reality. In the wake of this reality, some scientists have been working on a supplementary approach with a totally different philosophy. If human beings are going to impact the environment, why not impact with intention? How? Well, there are some crazy ideas. What if we refroze the Arctic? or suck carbon out of the air? What if we chemically reverse the acidification of our oceans? Or block the sun's rays with big mirrors in space or man-made clouds? The technical term for manipulating the climate is geoengineering. It's a growing field. In fact, it's growing beyond the scientific laboratories and into other areas like policy and law. And some of the biggest players are right here in North America. Now, one of the more controversial streams of this is called solar radiation management, or solar geoengineering. And before we understand the impacts this technology might have on our entire planet, we need to understand how it works and just how big the stakes really are. Solar geoengineering is one approach that's received a lot of attention, which is creating a sunscreen, limiting how much sun gets through our atmosphere. Welcome to Boston, local time 5.15. To learn how it works, the best place to go is Harvard University. The first thing you guys do. Canadian scientist David Keith is the leading expert in solar geoengineering. So I think I need to look at a more accurate geometry of what's happening. His team of atmospheric scientists is trying to determine if there's a responsible, feasible way to filter out sunlight by spreading fine particles like sulfur in the atmosphere. How do you get a million tons of sulfur up into the highest reaches of our atmosphere? So that turns out probably not to be that hard. So first of all, let's put a million tons in context. So the world now dumps about 50 million tons of sulfur into the lower atmosphere as a pollutant, and it kills several million people a year. Uh, so that's the scale of, of the way we're already altering the global sulfur cycle by air pollution, burning fossil fuels. The idea is to scatter the particles high in the stratosphere, supposedly out of harm's reach, using a fleet of high-altitude aircraft at a cost of a few billion dollars a year. Lots of sunlight would still get through, but through a controlled quantity, it could reflect just enough to alter global temperatures. The concept has been proven to work by Mother Nature. 
with massive volcanoes that have injected sulfur particles into the atmosphere and actually temporarily decreased global temperatures. But the bigger question is, can we do it without negative impacts? My view is that it's by no means clear that we definitely want to do this. I think it's nonsense to claim we have to do it. But I think knowing more about something that potentially is really useful for reducing climate risks is very important. And I think that the idea that we should have a taboo and kind of close our eyes and ears is really dangerous. And we make better decisions in the sunlight when we can see what's going on. Well, that's one scientific approach to geoengineering. But it has issues, and not everyone agrees it should be done at all. Thank you for flying with us today. In Ottawa, Pat Mooney has been studying the field as it develops. He's executive director of ETC Group, an organization that looks at how new technologies can impact the environment. Mr. Mooney. Yes, Bob Hi. McDonald. Good to see you. Good to meet you. Thank you so Good much for giving you. us your time. We no really problem. Glad to do it. Let's have a seat right here on the bench. Okay, great. So, what are your concerns if geoengineering was to go ahead? Well, it, it, there's so many uncertainties with it. Uh, it assumes a knowledge of how our, our planet works that we don't have. Just think that what would happen if, in the middle of blowing sulfates into the stratosphere, that we discover a, a volcano erupts like it did in Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991. We'd suddenly find ourselves not with a temperature decline that we thought we could manage of two degrees perhaps, but perhaps a decline of four degrees, which could be disastrous for us. So we're learning these things about our planet all the time, and the biology of the planet, the structure of the planet, and to try to do these kinds of huge planetary adjustments without that knowledge is quite scary. The scientific argument is that we need to do the research now so that if we do come to a desperate situation, at least we will have done that sure, research. Sure, yeah. Then we'll know what to do. What's your reaction to that? Um, there's two kinds of reactions. One is that the research always seems to get bigger and bigger and bigger because you can't learn anything at a small scale. The other major danger, we believe, is that it, it gives governments who have shown themselves to be remarkably effective at getting themselves off the hook of kicking the can down the road and not doing anything themselves are given another excuse. They're told, or able to say, well folks, we have this backup plan, so don't worry. You know, if we have another Hurricane Katrina or a Hurricane Harvey or whatever, Irma, don't worry, we'll take care of that for you, we, we have a plan. And that means that they don't then have to do the hard work now of cutting back on greenhouse gas emissions and, and getting ourselves ready for what's going to be a hotter planet. It's part of the appeal of geoengineering, a seemingly feasible solution to a daunting and desperate situation. It's almost like when you have someone who's uh, got a terminal illness and they're in the final phases and say, well, would you like to try this experimental drug? Sure. It may have side effects that are worse than the disease, but what have you got to lose? Yeah, yeah. Are, are, I mean, could we get into that situation with the planet where it's become so hot? We'll try anything. Oh, sure, that, that, that's certainly the case, uh, when, which is a reason to encourage more research uh, on all of our planetary systems to understand how best we, what our flexibilities are and our options are, and more hard work, of course, in cutting back on the emissions as fast as we can. But, but uh, I mean, if you're a patient, you're willing to trust the doctor. In this case, you've got to trust a politician. In New York, there's a group calling on world leaders to plan ahead. Our organization was just created this year, and what we're trying to do is shift the conversation that's taking place among the scientific research community and move it into the policy sphere, because most policymakers really don't know anything, if at all, about geoengineering. Sharf, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Cynthia Scharf was formerly the UN Secretary General's chief speechwriter on climate change. She's now... Senior Strategy Director at the Carnegie Climate Geoengineering Governance Initiative, C2G2 for short. Why do we need your organization? This conversation is too important, um, potentially too dangerous, to leave to just the scientific community. These technologies 
have planetary-wide impacts. They will affect not just our generation, but generations to come for hundreds of years. This is a global conversation. It's an intergenerational conversation. And we need to have it now because we are at a very dangerous point in terms of options. Um, our role is impartial. Our job is to say, this is coming. Be aware of it. Here are some issues that you might want to consider. Maybe having some kind of an international hold on solar geoengineering or looking at some guidelines, some governance of how we research and do testing of these geoengineering technologies, or what kind of national legislation might we need on removing carbon from the atmosphere. Why do you think the conversation with the politicians and the other social organizations is only happening now? Um, it's clear that even though the world has the Paris Agreement on climate change, we are still very, very far from where we need to be in terms of reducing global emissions and keeping our planet um, at a safe level under 2 degrees or even 1.5 degrees. Um, the gap there is enormous and very, very worrying. Um, that is why there is increasing interest in the scientific community to talk about some of these technologies. According to a group called Climate Interactive, the current pledges to the Paris Agreement still mean a global temperature increase of 3.3 degrees over pre-industrial levels by the year 2100. And that figure already includes some carbon removal techniques. So could it be that something like solar geoengineering is needed even if we do reduce emissions? Back at Harvard, that question keeps David Keith focused on his research with plans to do a real-world experiment 20 kilometers into the atmosphere in the coming year. It almost seems like an end-of-pipe solution, though, that it would be more sensible to focus on going back to the source of the problem. That, that's exactly the right question, because you, you're using some manipulation, some pollution to fight some other pollution, and the right question is, why on earth shouldn't we just stop putting CO2 out? The long run answer is, of course, yes. In the long run, if we want to deal with the climate problem, we must bring global carbon emissions to zero. So in my view, solar geoengineering can never be a substitute for cutting emissions, but it could be a supplement to cutting emissions. The combination of emissions cuts and solar geo might be a safer world with less environmental disruption and less great storms that hurt some of the poorest people in the world than a world where we just cut emissions. For more than 200 years, humans have been pushing the climate by adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. And there have been unexpected consequences beyond a warming planet. Storms are getting stronger. There's ocean acidification. Coral reefs around the world are bleaching. Are we willing to risk unexpected consequences of geoengineering? Or could we avoid a catastrophic climate crisis without it? For The National, I'm Bob McDonald. Now, from an uncertain future to a divisive past, should defenders of slavery be remembered in a hall of honor? The people of Thomasville, Georgia, have stopped counting how often it comes. They just know it does. It's that train the one carrying the most galling of cargoes. Canadian softwood lumber, Newfoundland, Quebec, British Columbia's best. Each plank more salt in the very deep wound of Bob Balfour. Well, it doesn't feel very good to see the tracks fill with Canadian lumber. We know it's overwhelming the country. In that rail yard shadow, three generations of Bob Balfours have cut southern pine here. But the mill's been silent for months. No match, the argument goes, for Canada. We know it's taking our markets away from us. They can undersell uh, southern yellow pine all over the United States. There's no way that we can compete with Canada. Here, in the land of the southern pine, that's a little hard to take. Georgia is the largest lumber products manufacturer in the entire United States, but that doesn't mean its own southern pine rules this place. 
Canadian softwood, this lumber right here, now takes a third of the market. Ideal for the construction industry, Canadian softwood is lighter, easier to pound nails into, cheaper. And that's always frustrated the U.S. mill owners. Decades of trade battles were supposed to end with a deal negotiated in 1996 that restricts the export of Canadian softwood lumber. U.S. mill owners say it didn't protect them enough. Point out that three major Georgia mills have closed in the last year. Many more, like Metcalf Lumber, are on the brink. Limping along, the owner says, in hope that when the current agreement ends on March 31st, something stricter will replace it. Canadians want just the opposite, complete free trade in softwood. That makes P.W. Bryant I shudder. I think the situation only worsens. Uh, probably we'll, we'll have to shut down. Canadian mills are suffering too, but there's a perception here that Canada has an unbeatable edge partly because of the low Canadian dollar, partly because many Canadian mills are more modern, more efficient. But the most unfair advantage, say the Americans, is how little Canadians pay for timber. Where U.S. mills must bid for wood on the open market, Canadians buy it from government-owned land at much cheaper prices. An illegal subsidy, the Americans scream. Don't bother trying to remind anyone here that that's never been proven. I don't think they're as justified as our plight. I'm telling you, the lumber industry in the United States is in dire straits. I mean, this is the worst. I've been in it 40 years, I've never seen it like this. Complex trade issues that deep in the southern woods boil down to one clear reality. It's really hurt our business. You know, I don't have any problem with them shipping it in here, but they should tax it accordingly. an entire industry on the edge. Convinced Canada is driving it into oblivion. Adrian Arsenault, CBC News, Thomasville, Georgia. When you take them together, what you do have is a statement about who Americans think they are. A long, festering, visceral debate over race and history in the United States has been exposed again, this time embodied in bronze, granite and marble, Confederate statues and what to do with them. Most of the controversy has centered on their presence in cities and states, but a room in one of the most sacred places in the country, the U.S. Capitol, honors some of America's notorious figures and ignores their misdeeds. Lindsay Duncombe got a tour. Inside the lawmaking heart of American democracy, a debate about history, race, and identity is playing out. Our historical heroes, some of them slave-owning treasonous rebels, divisive figures to this day, worthy of honor. The question is being asked in a room so rich in stories, historians like Georgetown University's Chandra Manning feel a bit giddy walking in. Oh, I get a kick out of being here. Um, Statuary Hall is just so fascinating in how it came to be and what it represents. The room now known as Statuary Hall was the first House of Representatives. After Congress outgrew the space in the 1860s, the room became a hall of honor. Each state could contribute two statues of deceased citizens, illustrious for their historic renown or for distinguished civic or military services. When you take them together, what you do have is a statement about who Americans think they are. And it's not all pretty. This is Alexander Stevens. Stevens is best known as the vice president of the Confederacy. And he was racist. Well, it's hard to say otherwise. Alexander Stevens owned 34 slaves and several thousand acres in Georgia, famous for his 1861 speech outlining the reason for the Confederacy. He said its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race, is his natural and normal condition. Here is a man who said that the fit station for African Americans, as we would say now, <laughs> is enslavement. Yes. And school children, African American, all races walk through and see him. And see him there, yes. 
There are 12 statues of Confederates in Statuary Hall and other parts of Capitol Hill. The state of Virginia supplied this statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee even before it submitted one of that state's most prominent politician, first president of the United States, George Washington. Just as telling as who the states chose is when they made those choices. That they would choose particular exemplars at a particular time makes it very difficult to stop short of the conclusion that the choice is very directly linked to a strong message about who counts and who should stay in their place. Lee, donated in 1909, just as laws mandating segregation were passed. Stevens, donated in 1927, just as the Ku Klux Klan soared in popularity not just in the South, but across the U.S., followed shortly by this statue. Jefferson Davis, a gift of the state of Mississippi in 1931. Uh, Jefferson Davis is most well known, of course, for serving as the president of the Confederacy. A rebel, essentially. Oh, certainly. Treasonous. Certainly. Um, yeah. Uh, to try to overthrow the government of the United States by armed force uh, is a rebel at best and treason at worst. And yet, here he is. It gives me pause that uh, this is not the place uh, for an individual like him. Uh, I see Statuary Hall as a place of honor, uh, as a place where uh, one would come to look at the true heroes of America. Congressman Benny Thompson, a Democrat, has represented Mississippi's 2nd District for 27 years. He supports legislation recently introduced by African-American Democrats in the House and Senate to remove Confederate statues from the Capitol. But he doesn't think it will pass. Not yet. A lot of people are saying, you know, it really doesn't make sense to put these statues of men associated with the Ku Klux Klan, with slavery and other dastardly deeds in places of honor. Because what they did was illegal, treasonous, and, and as, as I say, criminal. Republican House Speaker Paul Ryan said in August it should be up to states to decide which statues they want, so it's unlikely the bill will get very far. And recent polls suggest more than half of the American population believes that Confederate monuments should stay in public places. I think they should stay up because they're a part of our history. That Civil War and the Confederate part of the, the history is very important, and I think this generation needs to know that. It is important for the younger generation to learn about the history, the good, the bad, and the evil. History, after all, is complicated. This guy has swagger. He sure did. Zebulon Vance is a character son of a slave owner, Confederate soldier who later became North Carolina's governor, known for helping the poor and religious tolerance. His is a complicated story that I think makes us pause for a moment um, to stop short of saying um, we need to throw everybody out for holding opinions that are repugnant to us. Repugnance is part of the United States, historically and now. The divisive question seems to be where to draw the line between acknowledging and honor. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. Stay with us for a mirror image of Lindsay's story. A Newfoundland hero is mostly forgotten. Some people want to change that. Earth Day has been organized from this office by young people using all the enthusiasm and techniques of publicity which were developed by the peace movement. They have been joined by many politicians, for no one opposes in principle a clean environment. On Earth Day, we're going to be focusing the whole society's concerns upon the broad range of environmental issues that are coming up to the whole series of ways that we are destroying the world that, that some of us really want to live in 30 years from now. All we are saying is given the chance. 
They gathered in thousands here and tens of thousands there, but in our 136 countries, there were 200 million, the organizers said. But who could possibly count? In Europe, they bicycled. In Central America, they rallied. On Parliament Hill, there was a message from the man who wrote, Never Cry Wolf. With the help of the Wolf Pack, I want you to pick up that message and bounce it off this building behind me. Now, let's go! There may have been snow in the forecast and a cold wind blowing, but the drums were hot in Ottawa, even if the crowd was smaller than expected. No, there's a lot of issues that forcing this thing maybe to the back seat, but I don't know, I still think it's pretty strong. In Montreal, there was a march through the city. It's important to remember people, we are losing our hearth now. In Toronto, hundreds took part in an Earth Day march, walking from Queen's Park to Toronto City Hall. Here too, organizers admit the fight to clean up the planet is not easy, but it must be done. Although the environment is under great stress, we at least can show some hope. Earth Day sucks. There, I said it. Earth Day sucks. He's not alone. There's a growing group online. It's not the message. That, Norman says, is good, especially when it involves educating the young about the mess their parents have left the planet in. Now he sees corporations using Earth Day to sell stuff, and he doesn't pull punches. Earth Day should be every day. This one day per year stuff is garbage. All we are saying is give us a chance. One hundred and fifty years ago this week, Captain William Jackman saved 27 people from a sinking vessel off the coast of Labrador. It was a legendary rescue, largely forgotten until now. Chris O'Neill Yates takes us to Jackman's hometown, where efforts to restore his memory are underway. In the October hurricane of 1867, Captain William Jackman would earn the status of hero. Jackman had taken shelter at Spotted Island in Labrador when he learned of a schooner sinking about 200 metres from shore. To be able to jump into that raging storm and take 27 people on his back. In those trips from the shore to the schooner, Jackman saved all 27 on board. Mike Chidley and Glenn Jackman, a third cousin of Captain William, have spearheaded a heritage society in Jackman's name. When I first learned of this, uh, this act of heroism, by a man who shared my birthplace and my surname. I, I couldn't contain my pride. Captain William Jackman isn't even well known here in his home province. The Heritage Society in Renews wants to change that and make Captain William Jackman a household name, beginning right here in the town where he was born. Today, these steps are all that remain of Jackman's ancestral home. He was born in this house in Renews in 1837, after the rescue, newspapers hailed him as a hero. He actually received a year after uh, a, an award from the British Humane Society, a silver medal, which was the highest honour they could convey. In 1992, a postage stamp commemorated the legendary rescuer. Chidley and Jackman are pursuing their goal of memorialising Jackman with a monument in his birthplace. Undaunted by the lack of success in getting help from either federal or provincial governments. What do you think we lose if we don't remember people like this in history? Well, we lose who we are as a people. Uh, that's what we lose. Jackman died 10 years after the Labrador rescue at the age of 39. It's been said he never recovered from the ordeal of saving 27 lives in the ICC. That sacrifice is one people in the outport of Jackman's youth are determined to honour. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, Renews Newfoundland. Just before we go tonight, a quick look back at our top story. The Prime Minister gets a private offer from Donald Trump to rip up NAFTA and focus on a bilateral trade deal. The American administration and the president um, makes decisions that surprise people from time to time. Uh, and uh, that is certainly something that we are very much aware of and very uh, braced for. And Trudeau told Trump Canada's preference is a deal that includes Mexico. 
Some of the toughest NAFTA sticking points will be on the table this weekend. And that's The National for this Wednesday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to cbcnews.ca. I'm Wendy Mesley. Thanks for watching. Thank <laughs> you.